And so good morning, friends who are watching in this virtual space on this beautiful sunny autumn day. My name is Joseph, and I am thrilled to welcome all of you to this joint Remembrance Day worship service between Deer Lake United Church and Jubilee United Church. Watching through Zoom and on YouTube cross-platforms, we're techie folk, and so it is a joy to be with you. As a just as a starting note, uh, I do live for the people of Jubilee. Jubilee. Uh, I'm streaming from home. That's the first uh, thing you should know. And my home is in a basement suite. And above me is a wonderful family with a very active dog. So if you hear any barking during the service, uh, forgive me. Uh, it is what it is. It's life during COVID. And so my friends at Deer Lake are well adjusted to Sadie and her barking, but I just wanted to give that friendly reminder. But it is with a joyful heart we gather to celebrate and honor this day. Thank you. And I'm Graham Bramler. I'm the minister here at Jubilee United Church. Uh, and along with Joseph, today we have helped worshiping with uh, Donna Phillips, Don Strutt, Helen Martin, Rebecca Traherne, Gary Forwood has helped. Steve McLean will be laying the leaf and Andrew Burge is here. Of course, all of you, wherever you are, we are grateful that you've taken time to join us this morning. Both of our congregations acknowledge that we worship, work, live, and play on the traditional and seated and ancestral territories of the Halkamelem and Squamish speaking peoples. We do not have formal relationships with these peoples, but our dream is that our presence here compels us to think about reconciliation, about relationship, and about what it means for our future to further our knowledge and understanding of the relationship in our lives and in our witness as people of God. In our churches, we want to affirm all of you who come, whoever you are, however you are, however you need to be here, we affirm you and your presence. We always want people to feel as though this is a place for them, and we don't always meet the mark, but we strive for it. And so no matter how great or little you feel your faith is, no matter if it's your first time coming to church, your first time in a long time, or you were raised in one of these congregations, no matter what it is that you think might keep you from being close to God, the source of all being, we hope that you feel included in what we do here today. Regardless of your age, your skin color, your culture, your race, your marital or economic status, your ability or differing ability, your sexual orientation or gender identity, where you fit politically or theologically, this is God's family. And it is the diversity of who we are that is pleasing to God in this family that God calls together. When we gather, we light lights, reminding us that in the beginning, there was nothing and then there was light. Light that shines in the darkness and light that will not have the darkness overcome it. We light Christ candles to remind us that we are connected. It is the light from which all light comes and the light that has shone for generations and will shine for many more. And so friends at Deer Lake, we take this opportunity as we begin our time of worship to breathe, to settle where we are, no matter what week we've had or what week is about to, to come before us, we take time. We take time to worship together as a community of faith. And so we ring the bell to remind us, to remind us of the present moment. We praise you, O named or nameless one, for all the saints who went before us, who have fought our wars for us and touched our lives. For all the saints who live beside us, returning from a place that we know nothing about, yet they did it for us. For all the saints who live beyond us, who challenge us to change the world with them. We remember that the measure of a people's heart is this, to remember the sacrifices of the past, to work for peace in the present, 
to speak of hope for the future. And so we come now to name as our dream a reign of shalom, to commit ourselves to the cause of peace and to remember. We stand in silence, remembering the death. We stand in silence, remembering the destruction. We stand in silence, remembering the loss. We stand in silence, remembering the horror of war. To the soldiers from every side, to the women, men, and children, to the land and all that live on it, we stand in silence, remembering, waiting, watching, working for peace in our lives, in our community, in our countries, and in the world. We stand in silence so that we remember, lest we forget. Amen. The music today, of course, is being offered by Donna Phillips, who is the music director at Deer Lake United Church. And we're grateful for the offering and the ability to have music as we gather and worship. At Jubilee, our children are still meeting uh, to do Sunday school together. And they met this morning a little bit to talk about being prepared, what it means to remember and to prepare uh, ourselves to do what it is that we do as people of faith, especially at this time of remembrance. The ending of that last song is always one of my favorite lines. Remember forward to a world restored. And so when we talk with our children, we think about that. What does it mean to be good ancestors? What does it mean for us to be putting forward to the world uh, something that's going to be different? And so we're grateful for a chance to gather and to sell, share the stories together and to continue to remember forward. 
we're going to hear our scripture this morning. Thank you. The prayer of illumination. Mighty one, we prepare our hearts and minds to be embraced by your power. As we turn our attention to your sacred and holy text, we remember how many generations have given their own lives in protecting it so that we may have it today. It is this text that has been given from one generation to another for millennia that we turn to this morning for a word of hope, for encouragement, and for wisdom. May it be so. Amen. This morning we will be hearing from three different books in the Bible. The first reading comes from one of the oldest, if not the oldest, letter of Paul. The book of 1 Thessalonians. If you can believe it, the church in Thessalonica was having anxiety. <laughs> can you imagine? Paul responds by describing his first visit there. Views his teachings on how they should be living and how they should find strength in living together as a community. The reading this morning is part of reviewing his teachings. The second reading comes from the book of Psalms. This psalm is believed to be part of a collection composed by Asaph, one of David's chief musicians. In this psalm, he, it recounts much of Israel's early history. While it does serve as an educational component, remembering the past. It also reinforces God's presence and relationship with Israel. God has always been with them and always will be. And the last reading comes from the gospel according to Matthew. Jesus shares a parable, a short story with the teacher. It has been interpreted as an apocalyptic story. That is a story about the end of the world a time of great judgment and final verdicts. This morning, however, you are encouraged to not focus on the ending of the story, but rather on the beginning. For this is a story of preparedness and readiness to respond to God, to respond to God's calling in our lives. As you hear each of these texts, consider where death may be, where grief, grief may might occur, and where hope may be found. Hear these words. Our first scripture reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Sisters and brothers, we want you to be clear about those who sleep in death. Otherwise, you might be held to grief, might yield to grief and lose all hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, God will bring with Jesus all who have fallen asleep, believing in Jesus. We are speaking to you now, just as if Jesus were speaking to you. We who live, who survive until Jesus returns, will have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. No, Jesus will personally come down from heaven with a shout. At the sound of the archangel's voice and the trumpet of God, and those who have died in Christ will rise first. Then we, the living, the survivors will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. And thenceforth we will be with Jesus unceasingly. Therefore, console one another with these words. Unfortunately, uh, Helen Martin was supposed to be reading this morning, and I know that uh, Helen and Ken have been having a lot of issues with their technology. And so um, our next reading comes from the Psalms. My people hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden from of old, the things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We won't hide them from our children, we will tell the next generation. We'll tell them of your praiseworthy deeds, Yahweh, your power and the wonders you have performed. You set up statutes for our forebears and established the law in Israel, which you commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, children yet to be born. 
And as they come up, they would tell their own children. Then they would put their trust in you and not forget your deeds, but keep your commandments. And a reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 25th chapter. Then again, the kingdom of heaven could be likened to ten attendants who took their lamps and went to meet the bridal party. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they didn't take any oil with them, but the wise ones took enough oil to keep their lamps burning. The bridal party was delayed, so they fell asleep. At midnight, there was a cry, here comes the bridal party, let's go out to meet them. Then all the attendants rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, perhaps there won't be enough for us. Run to the dealers and get some more for yourselves. While the foolish ones went to buy more oil, the bridal party arrived and those who were ready went to the marriage feast with them and the door was shut. When the foolish attendants returned, they pleaded to be let in. The doorkeeper replied, the truth is, I don't know you. So stay awake, for you don't know the day or the hour. This is the witness of the early church and the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. And so friends, another week, if you, if you are part of Jubilee and elsewhere and haven't been joining Deer Lake, we're in the midst of a sermon series a sermon series on grief and on dying. What a season this has been. As numbers of COVID increases, we are reminded yet again how much life has changed over the past few months. There is lots to grieve. I know Deer Lake is grieving and I'm sure Jubilee and in many, if not all people across uh, North America and the globe are mourning the loss of meeting in person in their churches and their beloved sacred spaces. I know that uh, Deer Lake, we've been talking about the climate of the church and Christianity in our world. There is much to grieve as we even look to our future, as we think about the consequences of climate change that continues to have heavy and huge impacts and as we talk about the interrelationships between different groups of people and how are we going to live together? What compromises, what sacrifices are going to have to be made? Grief. We don't, as a society, do grief well. It makes us uncomfortable. We see it as a problem to be fixed or something to get out of as quickly as, as possible because we are pained. It's hard to grieve. It's not pleasant. And in our modern day of focused on happiness and self-improvement, well, no one wants to be in grief. And last week, we talked about how we respond to that grief. And we talked about the five stages that so many of us have heard before, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And all of these are different ways of responding to grief to loss. I've talked about how modern scholars have kind of rejected this view of the five stages, especially in a linear fashion. It's just not that simple. Grief is much more complicated and individual. And I invited you for the last two weeks to really embrace grief, to walk with grief, befriend grief, establishing a long-term relationship with grief, because grief well, it's, it's here to stay for a while, I'm afraid. And I know in conversations with, with many of you throughout the week, I, I know grief is hard. And for some, it's even too painful. It's a pain that we'd rather numb and forget. And I can appreciate that, but as your minister, at least at Deer Lake, but also just as a people of Christians all over this earth, we need to address this pain. Others of you have, have been grateful for this time of engaging with grief as we take more than just a couple of, of times to, or some, a couple of weeks to talk about, but really soak into it because the way through grief is to acknowledge it. 
And I'm afraid we're going to have to acknowledge more. And, and even now I'm, I'm thinking of Christmas time, looking towards Advent and doing that planning. And I'm afraid we're all going to have even more loss to come. Today is Remembrance Day, a day that originated in 1919 throughout the British Commonwealth, a day for remembering those who sacrificed their lives in the First World War, World War. Again, a little bit more about me. I come from the country that cannot be named, should not be named. Can I say that I'm from the U.S. now that we tentatively have a new president? Perhaps not. Still seems to be uh, some doubt there. But um, it could be that we have a new president. So can I say I'm from the U.S.? And one thing I noticed, and many of you I know stay tuned to the election uh, this past week and all of the drama, all of the anxiety and ups and downs on both sides of the aisle. And one thing I noticed as I was preparing for this sermon is how the politicians, the cultural differences between the U.S. and Canada, and it was revealed through politicians such as Joe Biden from the U.S., coming from the U.S., our military strength, our military might is something to be proud of and to hold on to. In fact, Joe Biden ended pretty much every one of his speeches that he made to the nation. God bless this nation and God bless the troops. The notion of a military uh, is such an ingrained piece of the DNA of the U.S. And in my six years here in Canada, I will say there is a subtle difference that Canadians have a mighty mil a military that has benefited the world hugely in conflict, that was a presence for peace and for love, for our way of being. But Canadians are more subtle about it. And then we have this day of remembrance. And then all of a sudden, the military, from an outsider's point of view, becomes on the forefront of everyone's mind, but not in a way of bragging, but as a solemn occasion of remembrance of what this life, what this life on this land has cost. It has cost loved ones. It has cost people who had families, children, a reason for defending this place. Now, I don't know how many of you remember someone who died from World War I that was over 100 years ago at this point, but perhaps some of you will remember someone from World War II and how they have passed away, or maybe you just are remembering this day of remembrance, those who are lost and have been lost in general. There is something sacred and holy about the act of remembering. I opened with a, a citation my first week when I was preaching on grief. I had cited this book. It's called Grief. I didn't have it at the time, but it's called Grief, the Price of Love by Shrimp Brickman. I get no money from this endorsing this book. So if you buy it, uh, I get nothing from it. But I've been reading this book and several others in preparation for this sermon series. And what he says is that grief is our bond with the dead. And he goes on to describe grief. Well, grief is something that every human has. To love means you will eventually grieve because loss is part of this reality. And he calls grief homeless love. So as we dig deeper into grief this this morning, I want us to, to think about and consider what pain there is in remembering, in remembering what we have lost, whether it is directly related to World War I or World War II or the great wars that the Canadian has participated in, or the small losses, the everyday losses of just not being able to gather in our sanctuary, to not see our loved ones, our lovely friends and, and uh, neighbors in our congregations in person. You know, memories can be powerful. Memories can make us smile. They can make us laugh. They can even make us cry. And for some, it's better not to remember at all because it's just too painful to go there. And yet there's something holy, I suggest, in that remembering. Psalm 78, which was read, the first reading, um, was no exception. So that 
the context, I mean, Don pretty much said what the context is that we have. So I don't want to get sidetracked on the context. Regardless, the psalm itself is a history of Israelites. Part of it is at the opening part. In fact, it reads, I'm going to repeat it back. I will utter things hidden from old. So this is the person's response to God. I will utter things hidden from of old. The things we have heard and known, things our ancestors told us, we won't hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation. The psalms, psalmist promises to pass on to future generations all that they have heard and witnessed. And what is to be passed on? The praiseworthy deeds of God, the power and wonders performed. But I really want to focus on this last verse. The last verse is verse 7, I believe. Then they would put their trust in you. So why do we want to remember? What is the purpose of remembering? Then they will put their trust in you. These future generations, they'll put their trust in you and not forget your deeds, but keep your commandments. One way of remembering is to, one way to, or one consequence of remembering is to trust. What does it mean to trust God? And do you struggle with trusting God? Do you struggle with trusting ultimately a mystery? I'm always weary of those, in a, and forgive me if you're one of these right now, that say, oh, I trust God just fine and dandy. So God is unknowable. God is, is not talking to you like God talks or like I'm talking to you. God doesn't appear to us the same way. God does not exist in this realm in the same way as the rest of reality. God is hard and difficult and filled with I don't knows and huh, what are we going to do's? And if you are someone that has more answers than questions, then I'm just going to put out there the curiosity of if there is an idol instead of a God, or rather our God, the one true God, because that one true God requires a life of faith, of uncertainty, of not knowing. And whenever you're grieving and whenever you're in pain and you're hurting, trusting God in that pain, that's hard. That's really hard because you're, you're doing that trust fall. You know, the exercise, you, you close your eyes and, and fold your arms and the people stand behind you and you have to trust them to catch you. You're doing that with no one else around except for this thing, this person, this deity that we call God. And yet it is that the act of remembering that actually helps us learn to trust better. And so I want to encourage you and invite you, invite you right now to think of good times in your life. Think back to your memories. Think back to the times of those, those warm, warm embraces, that climate of love and acceptance. And I want you to think where or ask yourself, where is God in this memory? And I want you to think of, well, sadder times, darker times. And again, I want to ask you, where do you think God was in those moments? And perhaps you can say, I don't know where God was in that exact moment. But perhaps God's presence was revealed to you in the days, the hours, the weeks, the, the days, the months, the years after that fact. And you can see long term there was something for good working in you or working in you and with you and for you in this world. Even if you weren't intentional at the time, God could very well be at work or dare I suggest God was always at work, just subtly there. And whenever I talk about the church or think about the church, Deer Lake and Jubilee and wherever you might be joining us from, think about the good times of the church and think about well, think about those less than good times at church and look at all through it all, through the good and the bad. Do you trust that God is with the church? Do you trust that God has this community, your beloved community? I keep saying over and over, this isn't 
anyone's church. It is God's church, and God has this. It's not about thinking it through or talking it out loud as we solve problems that are before us. The questions I have this morning is, how much energy and effort have you been doing with prayer? How much studying of scripture has the church done? Have you listened to the Spirit? Have you quieted down those voices in order to truly listen and discern? Or are we a, a church that trusts in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our pain? Or are we a community that responds to grief with control? With we've got to think it through. We've got to pull on past experiences from other places and other contexts that are not the church. And that's fine for those other contexts. And the church benefits from wisdom of all types. But there's something to be said that there is no other institution in this world like the church. And it is God's church. And God will lead us and will guide us if we trust God. If we trust God to embrace the pain, not to avoid or run away from it. Now, 1 Thessalonians, I don't want to get into the context that Paul's writing to, because it's very different than us, aka we aren't being killed because we're Christians, so I don't want to get nitpicky with it. But I want to focus on the very first verse, because that really stuck out to me as I reread it and studied it this week. What was read to you was, we want you to be clear about those who might, who sleep, no, sorry, rephrase or restart. We want you to be clear about those who sleep in death. Otherwise, you might yield to grief and lose all hope. Now, what I don't like about this translation is this yielding to grief. So I turn to my uh, NRSV, which is the more uh, closer interpretation of the Greek, and it reads, oh, it reads, but do not want, but we do not want you to be uninformed about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. So those are two different passages. One says you will, you will yield to grief in a bad way. And another one says you will grieve, but you will do so differently because you will have hope. Hope. So what is this hope? So uh, oftentimes hope is about the future. Well, hope is always about the future, in fact. But oftentimes we, we put it on a particular future, a particular circumstance. So for instance, we have hope that a presidential candidate will win. We hope that a COVID-19 vaccine will come out and be released and, and cure all of this social distancing and all these worries. We have hope that we can seek right relations with our indigenous neighbors. We have hope in a one day reality that climate change will not impact us as severely as what scientists are predicting. And that's good to hope though for those things. I hope for those things. But I wonder if instead of doing external hopes, hopes that we really don't have much control over, if you put me in a scientific lab and say, find a vaccine, I don't know if I could do very much for you. So we, what would hope look like that's more realistic? Hope that is more in your control, what you can do in your life. What happens if we put our hope instead of a, a vaccine, but we, we put a hope in gentleness with ourselves? In grief, our hope is not being told or telling ourselves that we are less than that we are weak, that we deserve this pain? What happens if we put our hope in self-compassion? And, and not only self-compassion for us, but for other people too, whenever they're freaking out and, and worried about the state of affairs. What happens if we put our hope in the grace of God? Our hope in the love of God? The last scripture reading came from Matthew, and I don't want to get into it, and I don't have enough time to really get into it, and that was by design. It, I, I don't need the fullness of that story for uh, this sermon right now. But what I do want to focus on is regardless um, of the end of the world kind of thing and judgment, all that kind of stuff, skipping over all those big things, 
the point of that, or one point of that story is that God calls us and we have to be prepared for it. Friends, God is calling us this morning, not to get over grief, but to experience it. If God is calling us to love, and if we have people saying that part of love is to grieve, then the logic says God must want us to grieve with God, in God. That's hard. That's hard because all of a sudden God comes from out of the clouds of someone that wants us out of grief into the midst of our yuckiness, of our, of our pain. And dare I suggest that is what Jesus did in human form. Christ incarnate to experience and walk with us in our stuff. The invitation this morning is to grieve, is to continue to feel that grief. But this week, the invitation is not just to, to grieve in isolation or, or just to experience it, but to grieve with your memories. And instead of focusing on the never agains, focus on what, it's, what it means to build trust through those memories, building trust between you and God, building on the hope of grace. As you think back to all that has been, and we do look forward to what shall be. When we as Christians grieve, it is with the trust and hope, not necessarily for a better tomorrow. And, and Graham may totally disagree with the statement, but we're not promised a better tomorrow. That's not ever promised with us. Our trust and our hope is not for that. Our trust and our hope is in God, that in God we will brace and, and be able to handle tomorrow. With trust and hope, God is with us and God's love will endure forever. That is the trust and the hope that we are called as Christians to believe and to live out. That is the path where grief can take us through trust and through hope. So friends, the invitation this morning is, is to join on this journey. Will you be courageous enough? Will you be faithful enough to keep remembering and keep continuing on. Amen.
We will gather on November 11th to honor the courage and devotion of brave men and women who made the supreme sacrifice of dying for their country. The hostilities of the First World War ceased on November 11th, 1918 at 11 a.m., the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Beginning in 1919, the 11th of November was set aside as a day of remembrance and honor for those who died, as well as to give thanks for the sacrifices of those who came back from serving their country. Since then, Canadians have fought in other conflicts and many have given their lives so that we might enjoy freedom today. They too should be remembered. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Eleventh month, eleventh day, eleven in the morning. A solemn bell begins to sway and ring its solemn song one hundred years in the past. Silence. Silence. Face the east. Silence. Think upon the ones who supposed when fighting ceases that war would never come again. Eleventh month, eleventh day, eleven on the hour. The silent soldiers seem to say that faith will not let us cower. Listen, listen, can you hear? We know who battled and were killed. We know the dreams that we held dear. Some bright day will be fulfilled. Eleventh month, eleventh day. A prayer sent by voices far away is hanging in the air. Onward, onward, do not flinch. Now the task is up to you. Push the vision inch by inch. Make our dream of peace come true. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We, we will, will remember, remember them. them.
They were young as we are young. They served, giving freely of themselves. To them we pledge amid the winds of time to carry their torch and never forget. We will remember them. We will remember them. Joseph, I'm sorry to interrupt, you're on mute. So friends, this morning, without mistakes and errors, we're reminded how human we are. Our acts of remembrance this day will serve as our prayers of the people. This morning, we tell the stories so that we may remember, future generations may remember. And together as a body, just as we join our voices and our hearts in prayer that Jesus taught his followers by saying the Lord's Prayer together, by speaking the words, our loving God, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so friends for the announcements of the life of our communities, uh, I'm going to go first with Deer Lake announcements. So hang tight Jubilee, just a real quick word of thanks to all those who joined our Bible 101 study. We did the entire Bible in six weeks, general overview, I know, but it was quite impressive and quite um, fun time to discuss the Bible. Look forward to future studies coming in the springtime. Also, since Rem Remembrance Day is on Wednesday, all of our Wednesday activities, including the minister's study, will be canceled. Um, so if you want to talk about the sermon, please feel free to talk amongst yourselves. Uh, if you have any complaints, direct those to Reverend Graham. I'm sure he's going to be more than happy to field those, um, those questions and comments. With that said, uh, we do have a special announcement. I know it's early to start talking about Christmas, but the season is going to be here before we know it. So we have a special video announcement from our outreach committee. Hi, I'm Linda from the outreach committee at Deer Lake Church. Christmas is still some time away, but it is coming and we are getting ready for Deer Lake's annual Christmas Families Project. The need is particularly great this year due to the current economic crisis. We hope to assist four families this year, chosen for us by Dixon House and Edmonds Community School. These organizations will be able to select families who could really use some extra support. We will be giving you more detailed updates in the next few weeks and hope to deliver our guests in early December. If you'd like to help with this year's Christmas Families Project, you can make a donation in your offering to the Hope for Families Fund. Please contact me or someone else on the Deer Lake Outreach Committee if you'd like more information. And we here at Jubilee are uh, going to help donate towards that if you would like to. Uh, I, after I saw the video from Linda, I called Joseph and said, can we uh, throw in some money for that? And so um, 
if you'd like to donate towards that, perhaps we can help more than four families. And uh, so we have two weeks, I think, the deadline for Jubilee folks is going to be the 25th of November to get your donations in. We're happy to receive them uh, to help towards whatever we can do for uh, the Deer Lake Outreach Committee. Um, if you want more information, please contact me and I will get it for you from wherever that's going to be. So again, you have the next couple of weeks to get money in here and then we will uh, donate that on your behalf to Deer Lake to continue helping with that. It is one of those ways that we can continue to help our communities that we share. And so it's great to be able to do that. Uh, as many of you might be aware, yesterday, Dr. Bonnie Henry and Mr. Adrian Dixon. Hopefully soon, Hopefully soon, Mr. Adrian Dix, after the confirmation of all the MLAs again, uh, will be, uh, have announced that there's a, a lockdown really for the next two weeks, um, trying to hold in a lot of socializing and all of those other things. And so we here at Jubilee have also agreed we're going to cancel um, anything that's been happening in the building. Our thrift shop will be closed. Uh, any of our user groups that have been back, like AA, have been asked to, uh, to hold off for two weeks as well. Um, it also means that the City of Burnaby Remembrance Day ceremony that was supposed to still be happening with a lot of social distancing protocols uh, is not happening. So I hope that there is a way for you to find on Wednesday a place to um, honor and remember uh, Remembrance Day together. Our Bible study happens on Mondays. If you'd like to be in touch with Dorothy Jeffrey, she'll help you figure out how to get onto that. Um, and just the last thing for us is um, the future of ministry survey for Jubilee has gone out an email and has been mailed out to those of you that don't get email. And we'd really appreciate if you would take some time to fill those out. Um, there's some important questions just to think about what our future looks like and uh, how we might uh, have it unfold with us. We, uh, since COVID happened, have been celebrating birthdays. And so I hope that if there's any birthdays at Deer Lake that you get to celebrate those together. And I just wanna name that uh, Deborah, Susie and Fran I'll celebrate birthdays with us here this week. All of the things that we do as communities of faith can only happen because of the generosity of people that come to our churches. And so we know that it's a tough time, but if you're able to financially contribute to the life and work of either Deer Lake or Jubilee, uh, we, will, we still welcome your offerings. There are a variety of ways you can do that. You can drop off the checks, you can mail them in, someone will come and pick them up. You can join PAR, you can contact the church for more uh, ways of doing that. See our websites, the information is out there. Uh, I always say, if you regularly worship with another community of faith, we know that they need your support too. And so we are just grateful for your generosity of being here and present in this place and this time, knowing that the gifts that you offer are gifts that we help um, the world become so much more. And so we thank you for your generosity. And so friends, we join in prayer a prayer of gratitude that made the gifts that are offered in time, talent, prayer, and service be used to help the world to know your kingdom, O oh God. May our communities give back because what we have first came from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
And so friends, as we come to the time in which we part paths, we now commend to you into the holy mystery, which is God. To live out the days that are your gift with thanksgiving and joy, with purpose and kindness. To make a difference in the world God made, to share with others, to be a bearer of love and hope everywhere you go. May the peace of Christ embrace you. The love of God support you. And the presence of the Holy Spirit encourage you. This day and always. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Now, I did forget to say that uh, both Jubilee and Deer Lake folks are going into their usual coffee time ways of doing that. So after the final song, you're welcome to stick around or go do where you need to be. So thanks for being here. I am. 